everybody. Welcome to module six. And I have some happy hands for you because this is your last module. So that's cause for celebration. I certainly hope that you have enjoyed our course. I know that I have enjoyed you guys. You've had some really, really good discussions on the topics that we've been exploring. So because we're nearing the end of the course, Goucher is going to be sending you an evaluation form for the course in the near future. So when you get that, if you wouldn't mind taking just a couple minutes and filling it out, um, any feedback that you would like to provide is 100% appreciated. So be on the lookout for that evaluation to be coming your way. And before we get into this information, I do want to let you know that the assignment for follow-up number two is available in this module, and the submit button is within that assignment. And you know you'll be submitting follow-up number two as a file upload, just like you did with file number one. So be aware of the due date for follow-up number two, and you are more than welcome to submit that early whenever you're ready, but please just make sure that you do get it in by the due date. And I'll be looking forward to reading your evaluations of your reading intervention programs. So we're going to be talking in this module about the research base and what that means, because as you know, that is part of your follow up number two. You have to explore the research base of your reading intervention program. So I just want to give you a little bit of information on what exactly that means and what you're going to be looking for. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about the different stages of reading development, because that's going to be important that you know that when you read the text and um, that you're going to be reading this week. So starting with the research base, there are different types of reading programs. The first type are programs that are research de derived. And these are programs that the content and methods used within those programs are supported by research and theories and a general knowledge about reading instruction. Research supported programs are programs that have empirical support through appropriate studies. And they're programs that you're going to find information about research studies that have been done with that particular program. And that they're going to explain um, usually successes that that program has had in a research environment. Okay, so the stronger programs, of course, are going to be the ones that are research supported. So when you find research support in a program, you want to think about a couple things. And one of the things you want to think about is the research design. What kind of design was the research? Was it an experimental design, which would mean you would find information about random assignment of students, and that also that there was a control group. So one group received the intervention and the other group didn't, or one group received the intervention and another group received another kind of instruction. So you'll see that there are gonna be two different groups that they can compare. A quasi-experimental group, you're gonna have a control group but with participants that are not randomly assigned. That is kind of questionable research if you find that. And you should also note that the participants in the assignment groups should be matched on um, all kinds of variables, including their SES, um, their you know, language background. They should, you know, the participants should be fairly well matched. There should be a pre and a post assessment in the research study. And you want to be wary of single group design research studies. So you might find information like, you know, oh, in this school in Arizona, the students performed blah, 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 blah. Okay, so that's a single group. All right, well, okay, so it was great in Arizona, and that's wonderful. But really, how is that going to work in Maryland? So you want to make sure that you're seeing research where they've conducted it with different groups of students and not that we're just reading about what happened with one particular group of students. You want to consider the methods and you want to make sure that when you see the research that they've described in detail the method of the experiment so that other researchers can replicate the experiments and you know from science that that's important that um, research studies can be replicated. And you want to make sure that the methods are described so that you're not left with relevant questions about, you know, what in the world it was that they did so that it's clearly described. And then you want to think about the assessments that they used. Were the assessments 
reliable? Did it seem like it was giving them valid information? And did the assessments match the question that they were exploring? Okay, so that's pretty much the information on the research base. Um, as I said before, you're probably going to find it, but you want to read it kind of with an eye of looking to see is it quality research. And of course, if you have any questions, you will email me and let me know. All right, so that moves us now into a discussion of the stages of reading development. And we're gonna take a look at this now because you're going to do a reading assignment this week where you're gonna find information on programs for the children in the different stages. So in order for that information to make sense, we have to take a minute and talk about the different stages. Okay. So first, take a look at these two different writing samples. Both of these writing samples were written by the same child, and this was a kindergarten student. If you take a look at the first sample, the top one, this was a sample that she wrote in September of the year, so at the beginning of the year. So if you look at what she's got going on here, we can see some things that she has learned. We can see that she's trying to form some capital letters. We can see that she's got a little bit of an understanding of the alphabet, um, although not a full, complete understanding of the alphabet. She's learned how to write a couple words. We see daddy and mama in there. And I'm saying she because we can tell what her name is too because we see her name in there. Do you see? Do you see the name Anna in there? So this is Anna who wrote this. Um, but you can see she's got some slant issues. And if you look carefully, you can also see that she's mixed some numbers in with the letters. Okay, but now look at the bottom writing sample. This was from Anna in April. So we can assume that Anna has had some excellent, excellent instruction for several months. So if we take a look, what do we see in Anna's sample now? We can see that she has concepts, certainly of lowercase letters. We can see that she understands what a word is now. We can see that she's got spacing. But what I really want you to take a look at is the idea that you can actually read what she's saying here. She has an idea in her head and she's kind of expressing it clearly. She's writing us a little story here and you are able to read that now. And if you compare that to what she was doing in September, we can see that over the months she has learned an awful lot of information. Okay, keep Anna in mind as we go forward talking about the reading stages of development. So Jean Schaal was one of the pioneers in describing reading stages. Um, I think hers was pretty much the foundational work. So here are Jean Schaal's um, reading stages. Her first stage is the pre-reading or the pre-alphabetic stage. Sometimes we also call it the logographic stage. And this is the stage that children are in from birth to around six years of old six years of age. Now the ages that you see on here are rough estimates. You know that all children develop at, at different rates, um, but these are just generally rough estimates. So the first stage from birth to about age six. Then they'll move into the alphabetic decoding stage from about ages six to seven, and that's divided into early phonetic and later phonetic stage. And don't worry that this makes no sense to you right now. I'm going to explain all of them, actually most of them. Um, but I just wanted you to see the full list of the stages. Then students move into confirmation and fluency stage, and this is where their decoding skills have gotten pretty solid. So what they're doing now is they're working to just build those skills. And as they're getting more automatic, their fluency is increase, increasing, and that they're you know, practicing those skills with harder and harder words. Then from about age 8 to 13, which is going to be right around the third grade, we know our students are going to make that shift from when they're learning to read to when they're reading to learn. So now they're going to be using their skills to support their education and to read text and to learn the information from the text. As they get into their teenage years, their reading develops to the point where they realize that there are multiple points of view in text and that they might find differing points of view within one text or they might find um, different texts that express different points of view and that they need to be 
discriminating and able to synthesize that information and able to make value judgments on the information that they're receiving. And then from 18 and beyond, so this is our college years and beyond, they develop that worldview, which is where they are now reading to understand the world. And they're reading information that they want to read for specific purposes. Okay. Now, Linnea Airy took Jean Shaw's work and um, added on to it a little bit. You can see that it's actually very similar. Across the bottom, you'll see... Um, the words that we were just using for Jean Shaw, the pre-alphabetic stage, the early alphabetic, the later alphabetic. Um, but Linnea Airy just kind of explained them a little bit further. The pre-alphabetic stage she called the incidental visual cues because children in this stage are um, very visual and they're seeing words as pictures. So they're associating words with um, different things based on just how the words look. And we'll talk about that a little bit further. Then in the early alphabetic stage, they're becoming aware of letters and individual letters, and they develop that ability to recognize and name the different letters. And their phoneme awareness starts to be built where they are um, developing an awareness of the different sounds in words. Then moving into later alphabetic, um, we start with some early sight word learning because you know we know there are those words that they just have to learn by sight and learn um, automatically. So a lot of the function words. They're developing that phoneme grapheme awareness. So the idea that certain sounds are attached to certain letters or certain letters represent the sounds. And they have that complete phoneme awareness. So they're, they can hear all of the sounds in a word. So they're not just hearing the beginning or the end, they're also hearing the middle sounds. And then from there, they move into the consolidated alphabetic stage, which is where the students can um, begin that more fluent reading. And they're putting all the sounds together and they're recognizing different syllables and they're um, noticing morphemes in the words and word families and using those skills as they continue to move forward in their reading. Okay, so I told you we'd explain them a little bit further. So to talk about the pre-alphabetic stage, remember these are our babies from birth to right around year six. The kids in this stage um, try to remember words by those visual characteristics. So you might have students who just try to memorize what words look like. They're not necessarily thinking about the letters. They're just kind of memorizing the shape of a word. So if you look at the word yellow, they might remember to look for the two lines in the middle. And when they see the two lines in the middle, they know that that's yellow. Um, if you think of the word kangaroo, they've got the two circles at the end, so they might use that as a way to help them just know what the word is just based on how it looks. They might treat words as pictograms, so if sitting on your bathroom counter you have a tube of Crest toothpaste and the kids are seeing the word Crest, they might just think, well that says toothpaste because this is toothpaste. So the word is really just a picture to them and a picture that represents the object. They might do things like think of the length of the word as having something to do with the meaning of the word. So if they had the word snake and the word caterpillar, they would say that the word caterpillar means snake because a snake is longer than a caterpillar. Okay, so they use that kind of logic to recognize different words. And I always tell the little story of my son who, when he was a baby, when he was, you know, around two years old, oh, no, younger than that because he wasn't really talking yet, we would drive around town and he would all of a sudden just start going ding dong, ding dong. And we had no idea what in the world was happening until one day we realized that he was doing that anytime he saw a Taco Bell. So he was seeing the sign with the bell on it. So that picture meant something to him. So he was attaching meaning to that picture. And he was functioning at that pre-alphabetic stage where, where he's getting those visual cues and the visual cues mean something. So if you take a look at this, this is a writing sample from a child in the pre-alphabetic stage. So now if you think about it, it's called pre-alphabetic because they really just don't have a concept of the alphabet yet and a concept of really of how words work and how words are put together with letters. 
So you can see that this child whose name you can see is probably Kyle, but even that he's not getting totally right because he's got some backwards stuff going on there. Um, it's really just scratches on the page and the child is probably you know, just taking his pen or pencil and just kind of like doodling on it and pretending to be writing. Okay, so that is pre-alphabetic writing. So then children will move into the early alphabetic stage. And in this stage, they're starting to get that awareness um, and they can identify first consonants in words. So these are the students who um, will guess at a word based on the first consonant that they see in it, or they will try writing words with just the first consonant. So they develop that awareness first of what words start with, and then they develop an awareness of the ends of words, and the middles of words come much later. Okay, so in the early alphabetic stage, they're really just getting those first consonant sounds. This is very interesting. Children in this age will do this, and you guys who are working with our younger guys may have seen this. Students will learn the letter names because remember, we're going to teach them the letters and they're going to learn those letter names. And they might rely on the letter names to figure out words rather than the letter sounds because they haven't made that distinction yet. So, for example, if the child is trying to spell the word will, they might spell it Y-E-L. Can you hear why? If you're sounding out in your brain, will, 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 the letter name that you're saying is Y, will, Y. So a child might spell that word with the letter Y using the letter name instead of the letter sound. Same thing is happening with the word watch, watch. Listen to yourself saying watch, and then say the letter H, watch, H, watch, H. So they're using the letter name of H to spell that CH sound because they're hearing that sound in that letter name. So they're getting confused between the letter name and the letter sound. Interesting, right? They'll, of course, confuse similar looking words like horse and house and lake and lake. And what they need to learn is decoding the entire word okay, from left to right. So going along with that idea of spelling by letter name, if you think about it, here's our alphabet. And if we spelled by letter name, the idea here is just to take a look at what are the sounds in the letter names of our alphabet. So if you just take a look at this list, it's just kind of interesting to think about. And if you look at H, you can see exactly what we were just talking about. A child would hear that CH when they say the letter name H. So they might choose to spell with that letter. And let's see, what else should we take a look at? Um, the Y, again, you can see W I is how you would phonetically spell the letter name Y, so we can understand why a child might make that error when they're spelling. So, of course, our, our language is tough, and there's that mismatch between the letter names and the letter sounds. So, you know, just something to have um, in your head to be aware of. The letter names that do not have the sounds that the letters represent, you can see those four there. The letter names and sounds that are most likely to be confused, and you guys that work with our youngest guys, this is I'm sure no surprise, this information here. And then here's a whole list of sounds that we have in our language that are not represented by any letter name. So a child who is still making that letter name, letter sound confusion, they're going to be at quite a loss as to how to spell the sounds that they're hearing with these sounds because there's no letter with those sounds. Okay, so children who are in that early alphabetic stage are struggling with this, you know, the difference between the letter names and the letter sounds, which is why we can often determine a child's stage of reading development based on their writing. Okay, remember how we saw Anna's and we saw Kyle's writing samples and we could say, oh, well, they're pre-alphabetic because they really just don't have a concept of the alphabet. 
So if we take a look at this, this is a child's writing who is in the early alphabetic stage. So if you just take a look at some of the spelling the child was doing here, you can see some interesting things. For instance, if you look at uh, number five, the word fish, the child has heard that first consonant, but then hasn't gotten a whole lot further than that. Um, boat, the child is hearing the first consonant and the t at the end, but doesn't quite have the awareness that the t is at the end and they're adding extra letters. Um, same thing happens with color. Um, I think angry is all kinds of interesting. <laughs> Again, it could just be the child just got the first letter, that first sound. Um, people, we can see they got the beginning sound and the end sound. God for dog, we have a reversal there. So they, you know, they've, the sounds are there, but they've just gotten them backwards. Um, I had a, a person one time tell me that if you look at the word um, color or the word angry, the children hear that and realize that it's um, a longer word. So they get that first sound and then they just keep adding letters, thinking that, you know, there's got to be more letters because it's a longer word. Um, if you look back up at number four, lady is interesting. But if you think about the end of lady, a, d, a, d, we've got a child here that represented the a, d in lady okay so there's another example of that letter name sound confusion okay so you know just a case of children spelling being a little clue to what stage they're in so they'll move from that into the later alphabetic stage and in the later alphabetic stage they'll be able to sound out regular one syllable words and once they start getting the idea of how words work and how we can put those sounds together into syllables and into words, they're going to increase their speed and um, whole word recognition is going to pick up. Um, it's still going to be laborious because they're still working at it, but it is going to get a little bit faster. Their phoneme awareness is going to be well established, meaning that they're going to be developing that ability to hear all the sounds in words, not just the beginning, not just the end, but they'll be able to hear what happens in the middle as well. And remember, they're going to have an idea of that phoneme grapheme correspondence, so they'll have an idea of letters that spell the sounds that they're hearing. But now spelling is still a fine art. Um, and some of you guys refer to the spelling as inventive spelling because the children are spelling phonetically. Um, the book mentions that we can call the spelling temporary spelling. I kind of like that because it gives the idea that you're gonna use this spelling for right now, but we know that this isn't the real spelling and we're gonna fill in the real spelling when we get to it, but it's fine for right now, it's temporary spelling. So whatever you call it, but phonetic spelling is a fine art, meaning that they can sound out words and they can represent the letters with a logical choice. It doesn't mean it's the correct choice, but it is a logical choice. So we get that writing that is still incorrect, but yet we can read it because it's phonetically correct. So children in this stage are gonna need to progress to learning those spelling patterns and learning how words are correctly spelled. And they're also going to need to move from those single syllable words into more multisyllabic words. They're going to need to look at uh, meaningful word parts, so like your prefixes and your suffix suffixes, and their sight vocabulary. Those words that, you know, we're just not going to be able to figure out phonetically. They're going to have to be working on those. Okay, so here's a writing sample in the later alphabetic stage. I know it's hard to see the actual writing, um, but the, the text is there. So I'll give you a, just a second to take a look at that. So you can see with this child that some of the words are correct, a lot of the words are not. However, when we look at them, we can get meaning and we can tell what the child was trying to write. So this is a child in the later alphabetic stage. And obviously it's an older sample because he's going to see President Bush, which, uh, is my favorite little thing there. All right, and then we move into the consolidated alphabet stage. So this is where we get to hopefully by grade three and the students have progressed to a point where they're now gonna be able to just build up their speed because a lot of their decoding skills should now be automatic. So they're gonna be able to pick up their speed to about 120 words a minute that they'll be able to read. 
They're able to recognize print chunks automatically, such as ING endings, EST, those high frequency words on those sight words that they've been drilling and the different syllable patterns and the different word families. This is the stage where they just need to dig in and they need to read widely because the more they read, the more words they're gonna learn. Um, and you guys who have worked with younger guys in the grades, second, third, fourth, know that they love those series books. I know that uh, my boys ate up the Magic Treehouse books because they like the dependability of knowing the characters and knowing the pattern of the book. And um, that makes it something that they can grasp onto and makes it predictable for them. So if it's possible, daily independent reading should be at least 20 minutes outside of school so that they continue building up their skills. And then beyond those early stages, when we get our older guys, now we're going to work intensely on building their vocabulary. We want hopefully them to pick up several thousand words a year, which uh, sounds like a tall order, but uh, it can happen. We're going to teach them advanced word decoding skills for encountering those multisyllabic words. And we're going to teach them those Greek and Latin roots, and we're going to teach them all the syllabication rules for figuring out um, longer words when they encounter them. They're going to learn that there are different text types and that they apply different strategies to different texts, whether it's fiction or whether it's nonfiction or whether it's a manual or whether it's a graphic novel. We read all those things differently. We're going to emphasize with them self-monitoring and what to do when their comprehension gets lost. So we're going to teach them those fix-up strategies. And then, of course, we're going to teach them all the strategies that we've been talking about. And we're going to continue to monitor them because a solid reader from grade three doesn't necessarily mean we still have a solid reader in grade eight. We've got to keep an eye on them and keep monitoring and making sure that they're, they're coming right along with us. This is a model, Scarborough's rote model, um, that really drives home the point that there are so many different skills that children have to learn to develop the fluent reading. And the stages, the early stages, develop the word recognition part of the rope. So if you see under word recognition, there's the phonological awareness, the decoding, and the sight recognition. And see how each one of them is represented as a little strand that you're going to dig into separately at first, but then they're going to interweave and get tighter and tighter and tighter as your instruction goes along and is going to become increasingly more automatic. At the same time, we're going to be building those language comprehension skills with the background knowledge and with the vocabulary and with the knowledge of our language structures and with deep reasoning and thinking. And we're going to be building all those skills also and intertwining those until they become more and more strategic. And then the two are going to come together and they're going to meet. And then the intertwining is going to continue until the rope gets nice and tight and stronger and stronger. This is a really good graphic for understanding the idea that if any one of these strands is not strong and is not a strong, healthy strand, what's going to happen to our rope? So we can see that, you know, the idea that reading is a very, very complex skill and there's so much that gets um, woven into it that a difficulty in one area can cause the entire thing to kind of fall apart. So just a, a really good example um, to illustrate that. So if we go back to Anna and her writing samples, and if you now with the knowledge you have of the reading stages, you could see that in September we had Anna who was pre-alphabetic. She just was developing a little knowledge of the alphabet, but she really didn't get it yet and how the alphabet works. And then by April, we can see that she's in the um, later alphabetic stage because she's putting together words phonetically and we can tell that she's hearing all the sounds in words and she's writing in a way that we can read. We can read her little story here. So she's progressed through the stages fairly quickly just in a couple months in kindergarten. Now, are we going to get that with all our children? Of course not. Every child is going to move through the stages differently. They are the stages that we're going to see as they're coming along. So now when you read the text this week, you are going to see information about, you know, this child is in the pre-alphabetic stage or this child is in the um, you know, consolidated alphabet stage. So you needed to have this information in order for the text to make sense this week.
Okay, so now going forward, I want you to take a look in chapter eight. This is still during our coursework for this module, pages 277 to 291, because you're going to see additional information on the stages of reading development. Our book is going to call them the phases of word learning. You're going to see a lot of information in there that we just went over, but it's also going to give you more information. And one thing you're going to see is um, a really nice list of strategies for helping students move through the different phases. Once you've determined that this child is a pre-alphabetic child, what are some activities that you do to move that child into the next phase and then move them from that phase into the next phase? So you're going to see a nice list of strategies in there. So take a look at that information. Then you're going to complete the reflection, um, reflection on the research base and the stages of reading development um, by completing the reflection for the coursework. And then the reading assignment for this week, it's a little bit crazy. So you're going to look at pages 491 to 505 in instruction, instructing students who have literacy problems. And on those pages, you're going to see that these six different reading approaches, reading program strategies have been outlined there. What I want you to do is I want you to pick three of the six to read about. And I don't care how you do it, just pick any three that you want to take a look at and it's going to outline what's involved in those programs and this is where you're going to need that information on the reading stages. Then read pages 507 to 513 which gives you some other things to think about, some other concerns, and then you'll complete that the discussion for this module. Um, and just a, a little thought for you that this is your final discussion so I'm sure that that's a, a very happy thought. And I'm going to look forward to hearing what you guys say. All right. And again, it's been my pleasure to work with you guys through this course. And I wish you all the very best of luck. Take care.